Hello and thanks for receiving this audio CD. My intention with this audio CD is to share some reasons why I believe the Bible is the Word of God. There is nothing more important in your life, whether you know it now or not, is to learn that we are all condemned by breaking many, if not all, laws that God has made for mankind. The penalty for breaking these laws is that we all die. Yes, a physical death, but we also die a death that will send us to hell. Laws like lying, stealing, using the Lord's name in vain, lusting, disobedience to parents, not forgiving others, not loving others, and simply not putting God first in all aspects of our lives. To avoid this wrath, we should believe with all our heart the fact that Jesus really did come to this world to teach us and to be the perfect example for us to live, but most importantly, to shed his precious innocent blood on the cross for us so we can avoid hell, which is, without Jesus, what we deserve. We need to put our faith, trust, and obedience in God's word. This is not a dream. This is not make-believe or some really fancy, conjured-up story created by men. It's the real thing. So please listen closely to this CD. Most of the work is from Living Waters Ministry, to which I was granted permission to use. The Compelling Evidence of God Thank you for stopping here, by either mere chance or by providence. I hope this study will give you some ideas how to share your faith and reasons you believe in our biblical God. Please don't hesitate to take key words from this study and dig deeper to verify the claims or to find more info on the subject. Have you ever needed a quick reply to someone's prideful comment, The Bible is written by men, or it has mistakes in it because it was written by men? How about someone who supports evolution, or even worse, there is no God? God says in 1 Peter 3.15, We are to be ready to give answers why we have hope in Him and His Word. You can do this in many ways, and this is my way of sharing my faith in the Word and God. The very first thing I would like to go over is how the Bible claims it is the Word of God. I hear too often that the Bible was written by man, so it can't be trusted. But the Bible doesn't defend its inspiration. The first book, Genesis, simply opens with the words, God said. It repeats these two words nine times in the first chapter. The phrase, the Lord spoke, is used 560 times in the first five books of the Old Testament, and at least 3,800 times in the whole of the Old Testament. The prophet Isaiah claims at least 40 times that the words he wrote came directly from God. Ezekiel, 60 times, and Jeremiah, 100 times. Over 3,000 times, thus saith the Lord, is written in the Bible. There are 3,856 verses directly or indirectly concerning prophecy. The Bible has put up a mighty headline for it to follow, and rest assured, it can back up what it preaches. When one needs a short confirmation on the authenticity of God's Word, I say, The Bible is a book written by 40 human writers, but it has only one divine author. In a time spread of 1,600 years, in 13 countries, over three continents, in three different languages, often speaking of one another without mistake or conflict, full of confirming parallels from the writers and having one central integrated theme. Well, that should give you something to consider. If that doesn't get your attention, then consider its 100% accuracy rate in prophecy. Over 2,000 prophecies in minute, specific detail are revealed. Not even astronomical numbers can give justice to the accuracy of Bible prophecy. After listening to this audio file, you should find it impossible not to see a designer who exists outside the dimension of time as we know it. In fact, if we are to believe Jesus is the Word manifested... John 1 1, and that God esteems his word above his own name, Psalms 138, verse 2. You can trust the Bible being a book that is literally worth putting your faith and hopes in being 100% true. Not only does the Bible have proven prophecies, it has other things in it that will build your faith and confidence so you can share your faith with boldness. Even though faith is the evidence of things unseen and the confidence of what we hope for, God in his mighty way has substantiated our faith with many evidences that are impossible to deny. The Bible claims that all scripture is inspired by God and it is profitable for teaching, 
for reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3:16 and 17. The word inspired, theonustos, in the original Greek language literally means God breathed. When the Bible claims to be inspired, we understand that it came from the mouth of God. It is the voice of God speaking to us. But a skeptic will say, everyone knows the Bible was written by men. The book of 1 Corinthians, for example, was written by a man named Paul. After all, the very first verse bears his name as the author. In a reply to this, we answer, yes, 1 Corinthians was written by Paul. Notice, however, what Paul said in chapter 14, verse 37. The things that I write to you are the Lord's commandment. Paul knew the source of his writings and understood that he was like a pen in the hand of the Almighty God. We must not view the Bible as the word of Paul, Peter, or Jeremiah, but rather as the message of God revealed through these men, just as it was written in Jeremiah 1.9. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. The Bible writers were not like the news reporters giving their personal interpretation of events they eyewitnessed, but were divinely guided as 2 Peter 1.20-21 says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke as from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Men were guided or inspired to write the exact message God wanted in the Bible. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. That's First Thessalonians 2.13. Please keep the thought of God speaking to us when we go over many amazing revelations from his word. We laugh at the knowledge man had just a hundred years ago. If man alone were the author of the Bible, we would expect to find many humorous errors contained in it. However, there are none. If we examine factual data recently found by mankind and compare it to the Bible's knowledge revealed hundreds or thousands of years ago, then we have powerful evidence for divine authorship. Also, the Bible does not contain any errors typical of the time in which it was written. Romans 1, 18, 20 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. What God is saying is that God's existence is evident all around us. We are a creation living in creation. It's scientifically impossible for nothing to create something, especially when you see this something in the great design we know as reality. Logic tells us that chaos and disorder cannot change itself from chaos and disorder to becoming order and design. Throw parts of a wristwatch up into the air and count the times it comes down as a workable wristwatch. And we're not even going to discuss where you found the parts for this watch. If you wait billions of years, those watch parts lying on the ground will never form a watch, workable or not. There's no way around this logic. That is why God says in Psalms 14.1, the fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. The Bible tells us there are things in creation that are evident to man, forcing him to conclude there must be a divine creator. Look at the sun, moon, planets, and stars. Look at the birds, bees, and trees. Watch the seasons change or feel a happiness when a newborn baby smiles for the first time. Listen to the church bells ring and watch the ocean waves roll onto the beach. Imagine where dreams come from and watch the petals on a flower open up to catch the morning rays of the sun. Who taught the dolphins and whales to speak and the spider to spin its web? Who designed the chameleon to change its colors? Watch as a cheetah clips its prey at 70 miles per hour and the eagle catch a fish from a roaring river. Who designed the hummingbird whose wings flap 55 times a second and deep sea animals to produce their own light? 
Look into the mirror and try to understand the intricate design that was placed in your eyes and ears. Who created the ground beneath your feet and the air that you breathe? You could spend the rest of your life looking at the evidences of God wherever you go because the evidence of our Creator is all around you. Job 12 verse 7 to 9 says, But ask now the beast, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, Who knoweth not in all these things that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? The Bible states as a fact things that were not known by science of their time, and detailed prophecy of events to occur before their time. Who revealed these things? God did. Let's go over a few of these. In the years between 1033 and 975 B.C., Solomon wrote in Proverbs 8.27 that stated the earth was round. He wrote, remember God really wrote it, When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, one might read, God set a circle upon the face of the deep. Now in 15 A.D., it wasn't until 2,500 years later that men generally accepted the earth is round. You may be surprised to learn that the Bible revealed that the earth is round also in Isaiah 40:22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretches out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Again, God revealed the earth is round and throws this in, which man only learned thousands of years later. Just recently, man found out the universe is expanding as though it was really stretched out as a curtain, meaning the universe is expanding. Man, for thousands of years, used to think that the sun revolved around the earth and easily accepted misunderstanding. That's what the sun appears to do. However, God wasn't mistaken when he wrote in Job 38, 12, and 14, Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring, or the dawn, to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? Listen closely. It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. Here God uses clay on a turntable as a symbol of the earth spinning, giving man proof that this is how the days are commanded. The Bible is full of these amazing facts. Today we chuckle at the people of the 15th century who feared selling because they thought they would fall over the edge of the flat earth. Yet the Bible revealed the truth 4,000 years before man discovered it for himself. Hindu belief was that the earth was supported by an elephant standing upon a giant turtle which was swimming in a cosmic sea. But the Bible states in Job 26, 7, written in 2000 B.C., he hangs the earth upon nothing. The earth hanging in free space wasn't proven until 1697 by Isaac Newton. For about 4,000 years, man hadn't proven how the earth floated in space, but God knew it. Between 1033 and 975 B.C., the Bible revealed the hydrologic water cycle. Ecclesiastes 1 7 says, All rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full, unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Isaiah 55 10 says, For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but the water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. This wasn't scientifically proven until 1841. About 3,000 years later, Jeremiah 10, 13 says, When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. The water cycle was not fully understood until about 30 B.C. by a Roman engineer named Marcus Vitruvius. Yet every aspect of the water cycle was fully revealed to mankind in 1600 B.C. The Bible's description is in perfect harmony with modern science. Job 36, 27, 29 for he draws up drops of water, which distills rain from the midst, which the clouds drop down and pour abundantly on man. Indeed, can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds, the thunder from his canopy? This simple verse has remarkable scientific insight. The drops of water which eventually pour down as rain first become vapor and then condense to tiny liquid water droplets in the clouds. These vapor droplets eventually bond together 
or coalesce into drops large enough to overcome the updrafts that suspend them in the air. The Bible refers to the surprising amount of water that can be held as condensation in clouds. He binds up the water in his thick clouds, yet the clouds are not broken under it. Job 37, 11 to 12. Also with the moisture, he saturates the thick clouds. He scatters his bright clouds, and it is turned round about by his counsels, that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the earth. Matthew Morey. 1806 to 1873 is considered the father of oceanography. His wife was reading a portion of the Bible to him while listening. He noticed the expression paths of the sea in Psalms 8:8, which was written about 2,800 years before Matthew Morey. However, Morey took God at his word and went looking for these paths. We are indebted to his discovery of the warm and cold continental currents. His book on oceanography is still considered a basic text on the subject and is still used in universities. Maury used the Bible as a guide to his scientific discovery. If only more people would use the Bible as a guide in their personal lives. All flesh is not the same. It wasn't until 1930 and the advent of the electron microscope that science declared that there was a difference in the cells of different species. Until that time, all cell structure was believed to be the same. In 63 AD, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15:39, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh for men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. All races of men are the same blood. In 1900, Carl Landsteiner discovered that human blood in all races has the same base plasma. But in 63 AD, God had already told us that in Acts 17:25 to verse 26. He gives to all life and breath and all things and hath made of one blood all nations of men. Life is sustained by the blood. God said it in 14 to 1500 BC. Leviticus 17:11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. In 1615, William Harvey discovered that blood circulation was the key factor in physical life. Not until the 1900s, that's 3,000 years later, did science recognize that blood gives life to all parts of the body. Up until 120 years ago, sick people were bled or bloodletting and died. There's far too much information about how blood gives life to go on here, so please study about how blood gives life and remember that God noted it first. God knows about clotting agents in blood, and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. Genesis 17:12. Why would God direct that babies be circumcised on the eighth day? Was there something special about this day? Yes, it has since been discovered that blood clotting element prothrombin is 100% and only 100% on the eighth day of life, greatly reducing bleeding associated with the procedure than any other day. God knew the correct way of preventing germ transmission long before man. And when he that has an issue is cleansed of his issue, then he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing, and wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in running water, and shall be clean. Leviticus 15.13 Up until about 125 years ago, doctors cleaned their hands in a basin of water. It is now understood that bacteria cannot be effectively washed away without running water. In fact, as frightening as it may seem, Doctors in the mid-1800s had no idea that microscopic diseases even existed. In 1845, a young doctor named Dr. Ignaz Simmelweis was horrified at the terrible death rate of women who gave birth at hospitals. As many as 30% died after childbirth. Simmelweis noted that doctors would examine the bodies of patients who died and then would, without washing their hands, go straight next to the ward and examine expectant mothers. This was the normal practice because the presence of microscopic diseases were not known. Simon Weiss insisted that doctors wash their hands before each examination and the death rate immediately dropped from 30% to 2%. 
running water. God knew long before man about microscopic diseases and how to fight contagious infection. And because we just went over microscopic diseases, let's talk about bacteria. In Exodus 22:31, the Bible says, And neither shall you eat any flesh that is torn a beast in the field. You shall cast it to the dogs. Thousands of years before modern science identified bacteria, God made a provision for Israel banning the eating of meat that may be spoiled by bacteria. It needed to be freshly killed, freshly cooked, and freshly eaten. The American Heart Association has told us, and we already know, many types of fats that are present in our everyday foods raise the bad cholesterol levels in our blood. Saturated fats come from animals. In Leviticus 7:22 to 24, we are told, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to your children of Israel, saying, You shall eat no manner of fat, of ox or sheep or of goat. God knew animal fat was bad long before man found out himself. Long before medical science discovered the importance of quarantining people with infectious diseases, the Bible instigated it. In 1490 B.C., the Bible tells us what to do with someone who has leprosy. Leviticus 13.46 All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. Without the camp shall be his habitation. Laws of quarantining infected people were not instigated by modern man until the 17th century. If only people of the 14th century during the Black Death Plague knew of God's commandment of quarantine people with infectious diseases, untold millions of lives could have been saved. God knows about the woman's seed being the seed of life, and I will put enmity or war between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15 This verse says that women possess the seed of life. The fact that women carry eggs was not known until a few hundred years ago. It was widely believed that only the men carried the seed of life. The Bible describes the chemical nature of flesh. Genesis 2.7 and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul or being. Genesis 3.19 In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Should you need to prove this fact for yourself, and don't, watch the body decay on the ground and see what happens. From dust to dust. God knew the rules about what meats were good and not good. They're called clean and unclean meats long before science found out about these. Please study clean and unclean meats in the Bible and find out for yourself what animal God deemed acceptable to eat. A great reading can be done by searching for God's free health plan at amazingfacts.org. The human body is an amazing thing when it comes to how it functions. Consider the miracle of the human body. Every second, more than 100,000 chemical reactions take place in your brain. It has 10 billion nerve cells to record what you see and hear. That information comes to your brain through the miracle of the eye, which has about 100 million receptor cells in each eye. Your retina also has four other layers of nerve cells. Altogether, this system makes the equivalent of 10 billion calculations a second before an image even gets to the optic nerve. Once it reaches your brain, the cerebral cortex has more than a dozen separate vision centers in which to process those signals. That's not to mention the miracle of the ear and how it translates sound waves into meaningful speech and sounds or of touch, taste, and smell. Coupled with that, your lungs automatically breathe in the right amount of life-giving oxygen, about 438 cubic feet each day, which just happens to be mixed with the right proportion, about 20% oxygen, 80% nitrogen, in our atmosphere. Each of the other vital organs and glands in your body work in complex conjunction with the others to sustain life. We could spend a very long time on how it would be inconceivable to claim the human body evolved by mere chance. So remember this in Psalms 139.14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. Billions of stars. Jeremiah 33.22. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured, so I will multiply the descendants of David my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. The Bible claims that there are billions of stars in the heavens. 
That's a pretty radical thought for 2,500 years ago. No one knew until much, much later that there were literally billions of stars in the universe. Only about 1,100 stars are visible to us here on Earth. Scientists now know that there are so many stars that they cannot be numbered. Even today, scientists admit they do not know how many stars there are. Only one to 3,000 stars can be seen with the naked eye. The Bible also says that each star is unique and God has each one of them named, every one of them. 1 Corinthians 15:41. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. All stars look alike to the naked eye. Even when seen through a telescope, they seem to be just points of light. However, analysis of their light spectra reveals that each is unique and different from all others. Note, we understand that people can perceive some slight differences in color and apparent brightness when looking at stars with the naked eye, but we could not expect a person living in the first century A.D. to claim they differ from one another. God created the lights in the heavens for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Genesis 1.14 the seasons change due to the position of the Earth's relation to the sun and the moon orbit around the Earth, which takes one month. How could Moses, who is the accepted writer of Genesis, know 3,500 years ago that the sun and moon were actual determining factors for of a year's length, Earth's orbit around the sun, unless the words were inspired by God? Another example, just one, is that when Jesus was born, there was a star that people followed to find the baby Jesus that had been born in Bethlehem. Many over the years have wondered what this star was until NASA Aerospace produced software that could determine where most heavenly bodies would be in space at any given time, thousands of years in the past and future. A very amazing thing took place with this software. It was found that during the orbits of the North Star, also ironically called the King Star, and the planet Jupiter, the king planet. They came into conjunction with one another producing what appeared to be a very large star to the naked eye. In their apex of their orbits, along with the rotation of the earth, this star appeared to stop and hover over the town of Bethlehem. Just think, God placed these heavenly bodies in heaven at the proper place and time knowing exactly when Jesus the Christ child would be born at the creation of the universe. If you would like to watch a video on this amazing story, simply type in the Star of Bethlehem on YouTube. In speaking of the sun, the Psalmist 800 BC said that his going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Psalm 19:6. For many years, critics scoffed at this verse, claiming that it taught the doctrine of geocentricity, which is the sun revolves around the earth. Scientists thought that the sun was stationary. However, in recent years, it was discovered that the sun is in fact moving through space at approximately 600,000 miles per hour. It is traveling along with our planet and other planets through the heavens as a circuit, just as the Bible says. Its circuit is so large that it would take 200 million years to complete one orbit. Television. What? Television is mentioned in the Bible? The television is a practical, not always worthwhile device that uses electromagnetic waves to transmit a video signal. The Bible contains passages that describe something like television, something that allows everyone on earth to see a single event at the same time. During a description of a future event, the Bible includes a passage that can only include the use of television. Revelation 11, 9 through 11. Then those from the peoples, tribes, and tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies, two witnesses in the end times three and a half days, and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two great prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now after three and a half days, the breath of life come from God and entered them. And they stood on their feet, and a great fear fell on those who saw them. All nations, tribes, and tongues saw them dead, and these people, obviously from all around the globe, saw them resurrected. Now how could nations or people all over the world simultaneously see the prophets' dead bodies lying in the street in Jerusalem, and then afterwards being resurrected? The answer is, 
the invention of the television and the deployment of global satellite networks during the 20th century, allowing news to travel the world at the speed of light for the first time ever. Remember that the apostles in the Apostle John's day, news traveled at the speed of horseback or camels. So does the Bible talk about a faster way of communication such as the TV? Do you think this may sound a bit vague and left up to interpretation? Then read Job 38, 35. Can thou send lightnings that they may go and say unto thee, Here we are. Wow. This has me convinced. The Bible describes the circulation of the atmosphere. Ecclesiastes 1, 6. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. The Bible includes some principles of fluid and air, Job 28, 25-26, to make the weight for the winds, and he weigheth the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain, and a way for the lightning of the thunder. The fact that air has weight was proven scientifically only about 300 years ago. The relative weights of air and water are needed for the efficient functioning of the world's hydrologic cycle, which in turn sustains life on earth. The fact there is so much water on the earth means the effects of the sun and moon's gravitational field are so perfectly balanced that if they were just off a hair, well, it would be an ugly sight for us earthlings. God spoke of springs of water in the oceans. In 1450 B.C. in Genesis 7:11, the same day all the fountains of the great deep broken up. In 2000 B.C., Job 38.16 says, Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Sources of fresh, mineral-rich, superheated water dwelling up from the bottom of the ocean to the surface of the ocean were discovered in 1930. In 1945, ocean volcano fumaroles and hot springs were discovered. But the Bible wrote about these things over 4,000 years ago. We're going deep into science now. Hebrews 11.3 through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. How interesting that this verse is in the middle of the verses where God explains faith, which is the evidence of things unseen. This mystery is explained also in 2 Corinthians 4.18. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal forever. It was only in mankind's recent history that the building blocks of the universe were found, the atom, which is the smallest known thing in the universe. The entire structure of an atom has an approximate diameter of 10 to the negative 8 centimeter or one billionth of a centimeter. What does an atom look like? Actually looks like nothing because an atom is made up of 99.9999% of something that is non-matter and unseen. An atom is only 0.0001% observable matter, yet everything in the material world is made up of atoms. Man can't see that small, but God can. God created the atom, which is the building block of the universe. They are constantly in motion, so what keeps things in front of us from falling apart or exploding when we know they are in constant motion? Why doesn't all matter in the universe just fall apart? Because God holds them together. I didn't say that. God did, as you will soon read. I told you we were going to get deep into science. We know that the electrons of the atom whirl around the nucleus billions of times every millionth of a second and the nucleus of an atom consists of particles called neutrons and protons. Neutrons have no electrical charge and therefore are neutral, but protons have a positive charge. One law of electricity is like charges repel each other. Since all the protons in a nucleus are positively charged, they should repel each other and scatter into space. So again, I ask you, what holds them together? God. Colossians 1, 16-17 For by him were all things created, that are in heaven, and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Because of God, all things consist. 
If God were to merely relax his grasp on the universe, every atom would come apart by fire. And that will happen one day. God said it would, Second Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements, the atoms, will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. This will be a day that no one wants to be a part of. According to the Bible, if you are saved, you won't be a part of it. However, God promises us that there will be a new heaven and a new earth after this. Psalms 102, 25-27 Of old... Hast thou laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands? They shall perish, but thou shalt endure, yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. There are three places in the Bible, Isaiah 51, 6, Hebrews 1, 1, and the verse we just covered in Psalms 102, that say, the earth is wearing out. This is what the second law of thermodynamics state. All physical processes tend to run down and become disordered over time. Running down and wearing out of energy. The universe will eventually wear out and succumb to a heat death. This wasn't discovered by science until recently, but the Bible had already stated in concise terms. God was at the beginning of the universe. He is at the present and God will be at the end. Who could stand in the way of his glory? No one. Without him we could not exist. Acts 17.28 For in him we live and move and have our being. God is the one who holds us and the universe together. It is interesting to note that science also has only recently discovered that our universe is expanding. Galaxies are moving away from each other. Psalm 104.2 says, Who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain? God wrote this more than 2,500 years ago. And also, very recently in man's history, has he found that the stars emit radio waves that are received here on the earth as a high-pitched sound on high-tech computers using satellite dishes for receivers. It is no surprise to God, for he wrote in Job 38, 7, when the morning stars sang together. In verse 7, one cannot say the morning stars were angels, as some would like to claim, because in the same verse it refers to angels as sons of God who shouted for joy. Two sets of things that proclaim God's glory, angels and the stars of heaven. The Bible gives the best dimensions for a boat on the high seas to stay afloat. In Genesis 6, God gave Noah the dimensions of 1.5 million cubic foot ark he was to build. In 1609, at Horn in Holland, a ship was built after the same pattern, 30 by 5 by 3, which revolutionized shipbuilding. By 1900, every large ship on the high seas was inclined toward those proportions. Why? Because man found out that it was the best dimensions for a ship to stay afloat. Job 38.24 says, by that way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth. God is telling us that light can be like the wind and from one direction and end up in separate paths of wind. But who would know back then that light could be parted into seven different colors? In Job 38:19, God says, Where is the way that light dwells? Modern man has only recently discovered that light, which is electromagnetic radiation, has a way. In empty space, this speed is approximately 186,000 miles per second. Think about God's revelation of light the next time you see a rainbow. There is an interesting Bible passage that refers to a certain animal that probably a dinosaur. In Job 40, 15, 24, God speaks of a great creature called the behemoth. The Bible says the animal had a tail the size of a tree. It is a plant-eating herbivore, and its strength was in its hips. It lived amongst the trees, drank massive amounts of water, and was not disturbed by a raging river. Imagine how big an animal had to be not to be affected by strong river currents when it crossed. Now read slowly, and the Bible appears to give the sign that this animal became extinct. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him or death approach unto him. In other words, God calls the largest of all creatures to end up on the sword or to simply die off. The reason behind this, however, is not given in the Bible. It is a prime example of God's handiwork, and only its creator can threaten it. 
Science expresses the universe in five terms. Time, space, matter, power, and motion. Genesis 1, 1 to 2 perfectly reveals such truths to the Hebrews in 1450 B.C. In the beginning time, God created power, the heavens, space, and the earth, matter, and the Spirit of God moved, which is motion, upon the faces of the water. The very first thing God tells man is that he controls all aspects of the universe. Plants need sunlight, water, and soil, minerals, to grow and so make their own energy and food. Take one away and the plant dies. It is interesting to note that the chronological order of creation given in Genesis, God first created light, then he created water, then soil, and then he created the plant life, Genesis 1 verse 3 to verse 9. In prophecies, hundreds of prophecies have come true, really about 2,000 with about 500 more to go. More than 50 have found fulfillment or partial fulfillment during the last 200 years. To even touch base in a small way with biblical prophecy would require a monumental amount of time that I don't have. No matter how much would be said about it, there would be much more left to learn. All I can say is that prophecies in themselves are proof enough to make a believer of anyone who uses cognitive thinking. But God has proven himself in the next breath you take. It doesn't do justice, but here are just a few prophecies. And what better prophecy than that of the coming of Jesus? The Bible has hundreds of prophecies about Jesus and his coming. Consider these. The Bible prophesied exactly when Jesus would be born. This prophecy is in Daniel 9:22 to 27, which is written about 530 years before Christ came. The prophet Daniel said the Messiah would come 483 years after the commandment was given to rebuild Jerusalem. And that is exactly when he was born. The Bible prophesied exactly when Jesus would be born in the little town of Bethlehem in the province of Judah in Israel. That is in Micah 5 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. That amazing prophecy was written down 700 years before Jesus was born. The Bible prophesied that Jesus would be rejected by his own people, the nation of Israel. This was written by the prophet Isaiah about 710 years before Jesus was born. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. That's Isaiah 53.3. The Bible prophesied that Jesus would die by crucifixion. This was written in Psalms 22, 14 to 16, about a thousand years before Jesus was born. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. They pierced my hands and my feet, and we all know about that. This is an amazing and perfect description of death by crucifixion. And when the prophet David wrote, crucifixion was not even practiced at that time. Actually, the Phoenicians developed it and Rome borrowed the agonizing means of execution from them. So when Rome ruled over Israel, it became the Roman means of capital punishment imposed upon the Jews. But the Jews' means of execution was stoning. The Bible prophesied that soldiers would gamble for Jesus' robe at the foot of the cross. This was written in Psalms 22:18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. The wicked, callous soldiers did this as Jesus was suffering. The Bible prophesied that none of Jesus' bones would be broken during the crucifixion. This was prophesied in Psalms 34:20 about 1,000 years before Jesus was born. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. The Bible prophesied that Jesus would be buried in the tomb of a rich man. This was written in Isaiah 53.9, about 710 years before Jesus was born. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. This was fulfilled when Jesus was taken down off the cross by a wealthy disciple and buried in the disciple's own tomb. The Bible prophesied that Jesus would rise from the dead. This was written in Psalm 16:10 about a thousand years before Jesus came to earth as a man. 
For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, translated as grave, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption, meaning to dissolve or decompose back into the ground. Reminds me once again of the dust to dust, ashes to ashes verse in Genesis 3.19. But Jesus did not return to the dust. He was resurrected. The scriptures predicted the rise and fall of great empires like Greece and Rome in Daniel 2.39 and 40 and foretold the destruction of cities like Tyre and Sidon in Isaiah 23, Zechariah 9.4, and Ezekiel 26.12. Jesus gave a noteworthy prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem and the spreading of Jews throughout the world, and which is recorded in Luke 21. In 70 AD, not only was Jerusalem destroyed by Titus, the future emperor of Rome, but another prediction from Jesus in Matthew 24, 1 and 2 came to pass, the complete destruction of the temple of God. The Bible's prediction of the Middle East conflict, something you can see for yourself today, in Genesis 6:12, God said that Ishmael, the father of the Arab race, would be a wild man, and every man's hand will be against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brothers. Almost 4,000 years later, who can deny that this prophecy is being fulfilled in the Arab race? The Arabs and the Jews are brothers, having Abraham as their ancestor. The whole Middle Eastern conflict is caused by their dwelling together. To be more specific, it started with Abraham and Sarah not having faith that God would grant them a child in their old age and seek another woman to bear a son to help fulfill God's promise. Wrong move, wouldn't you say? God does not need help to fulfill his promises. In the book of Daniel, the Bible prophesies the coming of the one and only Jewish Messiah prior to the temple's demise. The Old Testament prophets declared he would be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2, to a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14, betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11, 12, and 13, die by crucifixion, Psalm 22, and be buried in a rich man's tomb, Isaiah 53, 9. There is only one person who fills all these messianic prophecies who lived before 70 AD, and that was Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Mary, the mark of the beast. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slaves, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. That's Revelations 13, 16 to 17. The mark of the beast is here and waiting to be implemented into its prophecy. The radio frequency identification chip has already been put in animals and some children for ID purposes and adults recently. Your information about you is not in the chip but in a supercomputer. All the computer needs is the code concealed in the chip by simply scanning it with a radio frequency. Once the computer receives your ID, it tells the person scanning who you are, where you live, what you owe, what you own. And in Bible prophecy, if you don't have this RFI chip, you will not be able to buy, sell, or trade. Everyone's money will be digitalized, and only this digital currency will be accepted. Sounds bizarre, but look at your credit card, and that little chip that has recently been placed on it is getting smaller and smaller. The great image that was seen in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream was interpreted by Prophet Daniel. Please read these passages. Isaiah 13, 9, 22, Ezekiel 26, 3 to 5, Ezekiel 28, 21 to 23, Isaiah 44, 28, and 45, 1, Daniel 8, 20 to 21, and Micah 5, 2. Daniel 2 predicted the major nations that have ruled over the world, and yes, they came to pass. In fact, there are prophecies that include the coming of the one world government, the one false prophet, and the one world leader that appear to be taking place even today. One of the signs that Jesus gave for his return would be the repossession of Jerusalem by the Jews. This happened in 1967 after 2,000 years brought into culmination all the signs of the times. These are combined for Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, 1 Timothy 4, and 2 Timothy 3. Some of the signs of the times that are growing in exponential numbers are famines, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, and pestilences. Also, false 
prophets and false Christs will abound. Never before since recently has this world seen such an increase in these things. The Battle of Armageddon, that's Joel 2, 1 through 10, relates to a striking account of the coming Battle of Armageddon, the greatest of all battles. And this vision, which seems to entail flame-throwing tank warfare, was given approximately 2,800 years ago. The prophet relates to the only thing he has seen in battle, horse-drawn chariots. Think of modern warfare and compare. Fire goes before them. Verse 3, they burn what is behind them. Verse 3, they destroy everything in their path. Verse 3, they move at the speed of horse, which is about 30 to 40 miles per hour. That's verse 4. The rumbling sounds are like the noise of many chariots and the roar of fire. Verse 5. They climb over walls. Verse 7. They don't break ranks. Verse 7. The sword can't stop them. Verse 8. They climb into houses. Verse 9. And they make the earth quake. Verse 10. Sounds like tanks to me. The Bible and nuclear war. Yes, nuclear war. Ezekiel 39, written over 2,500 years ago, speaks of God's judgment upon the enemies of Israel. Verses 12 to 15 describe what will happen after what many see as the Battle of Armageddon. And seven months shall the house of Israel be bearing of them, that they may cleanse the land, and they shall sever out men of continual employment, passing through the land to bury with the passengers, those that remain upon the face of the earth, to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search, and the passengers that pass through the land, when they see a man's bone, then shall he set up a sign by it, till the barriers bury it in the valley of Hamangog. Before the days of nuclear warfare, the portion of the Bible would make no sense to the reader. We are told that even the weapons left by the enemy will have to be burned. That's Ezekiel 39.9. So many will die that it will take those specially employed to the purpose seven months to bury the dead. Verse 14. The scriptures are very specific about the method of burial. When a bone is found by the searchers, a special marker is placed by the bone until the barriers bury it. This would seem to be clear reference to radio contamination after nuclear war. This thought is confirmed by Joel 2.30, which speaks of pillars of smoke. And in Zechariah 14.12, let it cast no doubt when the Bible foretells us something that happens during nuclear war to people, something that mankind only recently learned about. And this shall be the plague in which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. Also take note that in the book of Second Peter 3.10 it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are inside shall be burned up. This looks like nuclear war being the onset of the return of Jesus, but it also may be the byproduct of Jesus himself when he returns. We don't know. In Isaiah 66, 7, 8, which is 700 B.C., the prophet gives a strange prophecy. Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. In 1922, the League of Nations gave Great Britain the mandate or political authority over Palestine. On May 14, 1948, Britain withdrew her mandate and the nation of Israel was born in a day. There are over 25 Bible prophecies concerning Palestine that have been literally fulfilled. Probability estimates conclude the chances of these randomly fulfilled are less than one chance in 33 million. Jesus was very precise in his prophecy about the destruction of the temple, saying, Do you not see all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. That's Matthew 24, 2 and Luke 21, 6. Why was Jesus so specific about these stones? The historian Josephus wrote of the temple's destruction by the Romans in 70 AD. They carried away every stone of the sacred temple, partially in a frenzied search for every last piece of gold ornamentation melted in the awful heat of the fire. History and archaeology confirm the biblical record. 
Over 25,000 sites have now been discovered that pertain to the Bible. As Nelson Gluick, renowned Jewish archaeologist, said, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Even though archaeology does not prove spiritual truth, archaeological confirmation is an amazing testimony to the accuracy of the Bible. Sulfur balls can be found at the site of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sulfur balls, unlike anything found on earth, 98% sulfur. Some of this sulfur has been partially burned. Scientists claim sulfur found in this area show how the cities were destroyed by fire. The Moabite stone discovered in 1868 at Dibon, Jordan, confirmed the Moabite attacks on Israel as recorded in 2 Kings 1 and 3. The Lachish letters discovered 1932 to 1938. 24 miles north of Beersheba described the attack of Nebuchadnezzar on Jerusalem in 586 B.C. The Cyrus Cylinder records Cyrus' overthrow of Babylon and his subsequent deliverance of the Jewish captives. Cyrus was often depicted positively in the Western tradition by sources such as the Old Testament of the Bible. The Bible records that some Jews who were exiled by the Babylonians returned to their homeland from Babylon where they had been settled by Nebuchadnezzar to rebuild the temple following an edict from Cyrus. The book of Ezra, chapter 1, verse 4 to 5, provides a narrative account of the rebuilding project. The Rosetta Stone, discovered in 1799 in Egypt by Napoleon's scientist, was written in three languages, hieroglyphic, demotic, and Greek. It unlocked the mystery of the understanding of hieroglyphics. Understanding the ancient hieroglyphics has helped us to confirm the authenticity of the Bible. Critics say that there were no ancient writings about Jesus outside the New Testament. Writings from these historians outside the Bible confirm the birth, death, ministry, and resurrection. And I'll try these names out. Flavius Josephus, the Babylonian Talmud, Pliny the Younger's letter to the Emperor Trajan, the Annals of Tychetus, Marabar, Serapion, and Suetonius. The scriptures make more than 40 references to the great Hittite Empire. However, until 100 years ago, there was no archaeological evidence to substantiate the Bible's claim that the Hittites ever existed. Skeptics declared the Bible was an error until their mouths dropped in 1906. Hugo Winkler uncovered a huge library of 1,000 clay tablets which completely documented the lost Hittite Empire. We now know that at its height, the Hittite civilization rivaled Egypt and Assyria in its glory and power. The Trinity, the Trinity. This may be an unfair reference to something that only could come from God. I say unfair because the subject demands too much time to encapsulate the understanding. It is the nature of the Trinity of God. It is taught in the Bible that God is one, Deuteronomy 6, 4. But the Bible reveals that God is in three persons, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches Jesus is God and came to earth as a man, and at that time he was fully God and fully man, but he also prayed to God the Father in heaven many times. Jesus received praise and was called my Lord on earth. Without a doubt, Jesus is God, for he said in John 14, 9, He that has seen me has seen the Father. But you may ask, how can that be? The Bible says in Colossians 2, 9, for in him Jesus dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Even the Holy Spirit is God, for every pronoun that is used in reference to him is a personal pronoun, such as he and him. The Holy Spirit possesses the attributes of omniscience, omnipresence, and the eternality that God could only possess. Peter, in Acts 5, 3-4, when speaking to Ananias about stealing money, said that he lied to the Holy Spirit. And in the next sentence, Peter said, You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Paul referred to the Holy Spirit as God in 2 Corinthians 3:17 to 18 stating, Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. In Luke 3:22, after Jesus being baptized, all three persons of the Godhead were mentioned, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. It is easy to get confused trying to understand something spiritual and eternal with a mortal mind. 
You simply have to let go and allow God to give you understanding. Throughout the whole entirety of the Bible is revealed in three persons. It is a super complex revelation revealed over 1,600 years of writings that 40 men could in no way get together and work such an immensely complicated God without making many mistakes. People who want to refute the Bible often jerk verses out of context referring to the Trinity. But in reality, it only shows that the person is spiritually unlearned. In fact, I believe understanding the Trinity is a miracle because it can only be understood by those who set forth just a mustard seed of faith to opening up and asking God to reveal himself. Medical science defends the crucifixion of Jesus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus knew of his impending doom that was soon to transpire, giving the sacrifice of all sacrifices. Jesus was already in mental agony before the physical agony was upon him. In Luke 22:44, the Bible says, His sweat was as if it were great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Some have tried to defend the impossibility of bloody sweat. However, a thorough search of the medical literature demonstrates such a condition, while admittedly rare, can occur. Commonly referred to as hemotridrosis or hemohydrosis, this condition results in the excretion of blood or blood pigment in the sweat. Under conditions of great emotional stress, tiny capillaries in the sweat glands can rupture, thus mixing blood with perspiration. Scourging. The scourging was a legal preliminary to every Roman execution because it weakened the victim through shock and blood loss. Without scourging, strong, condemned men might live on the cross for several days until exposed. Wild animals, insects, or birds resulted in their death. The tool for scourging is a short whip with a several single or braided leather thongs of variable lengths in which small iron balls or sharp pieces of sheep bones were tied at intervals. The impact devices would rip the skin, leaving flesh, tendons, and muscles exposed while allowing much blood loss. Then, as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. Pain and blood loss generally set the stage for circulatory shock. During scourging, the victim would experience an oozing of blood from cutaneous capillaries and veins until the wounds were deep enough to cause arterial blood to spurt out rhythmatically with each successive heartbeat. In many cases, scourging was itself fatal. The blood loss suffering by Christ during his scourging would have been substantial and would have resulted in a lowered blood pressure and reduced flow of blood throughout his body. In this condition, persisted hypovolemic shock would have set in, characterized by a reduced blood flow to the cells and tissues, which then would lead to irreversible cell and organ damage and eventually death. The prophet Isaiah provided a graphic description of the outward appearance of our Lord when he had undergone the scourging. Like as many were astonished at thee, his visage or appearance was so marred more than any other man, and his form more than any of the sons of men. Isaiah 52:14. Christ's body was so disfigured that he almost did not appear human anymore, yet sadly the worst was still to come. A crown of thorns was pressed into his head, and then more punches to the head were dispensed. The significance of Jesus bearing a scarlet robe during the course of his agonizing persecution signified the taking of his sins of the world. Isaiah commented on the meaning of the scarlet color. Come now and let us reason together, saith Jehovah. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So Isaiah 118. Each time Jesus was stripped or made to wear his robe, the fresh wounds would reopen and bleed, inflicting still more pain. And yet he continued onwards toward the cross, even though he had the power to stop the pain and agony at any given second. At this point, you may ask, what does this prove? How does this prove the textual validity of the Bible? What it proves is that the recorded systematic and progressive path that the Romans used to crucify people in their historical medical records were also repeated in the Bible. Also, historians outside the Bible, such as Josephus, recorded the same thing. Continuing, it's amazing that after being scourged and carrying the cross that long, Jesus would be the victim of uncontrollable thirst. Jesus received his first of two drinks at Golgotha. The first, a drugged wine mixed with myrrh, 
that served as a mild analgesic to deaden some of the pain was offered immediately upon his arrival. However, after having tasted it, Christ refused the concoction. He chose to face death with a clear mind so he could conquer it willfully as he submitted himself to the cruelty of the cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink. Matthew 27:33-34. Jesus knew the next thing to happen was being nailed to the cross. Imagine how much God loved us to stay sober knowing he was soon to be nailed to the cross. The second drink that Jesus was offered on the cross came after his plaintive cry. He accepted this potion which consisted of wine vinegar just moments before his death. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things are now finished, that the scripture might be accomplished, saith, I thirst. Set there was a vessel full of vinegar. So they put a sponge full of the vinegar upon hyssop and brought it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. John 19:28. Finally, after Jesus died, we are allowed to question about the fluids that came out of the side of Jesus when he was pierced by the Roman soldier. Blood and water. The Apostle John does not denote what side was pierced, but the blood could have resulted from the heart area, the aorta, or any of the pulmonary vessels. Water probably was provided by the pleural or pericardial fluids that surround the lungs and heart. It is with both medical and biblical certainty that we know Christ died upon the cross of Calvary. Why has God put all this proof in the Bible? My answer is this, because your salvation is the most important thing you will ever consider. God is a loving God, but he is also going to be your final judge, and if your sins in this life are not forgiven through your acceptance of what Jesus has done for you, then you will pay for your sins in hell. God did not send himself to die on the cross so you could go on living a sinful life. He died so that you may escape hell and have eternal life with him in heaven. With all this proof, how could anyone deny the fact that God does exist? Of course, the greatest evidence of the Bible's inspiration is shown in changed lives with those who put their faith in it. 1 John 1 3 says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. It is a very simple thing that the disciples were doing, telling others what they have seen and heard concerning Jesus Christ. You too have have the ability to do the same. You have a special experience with the Lord that no one else has had and you can share that with others. And lastly, a little something to ponder, some more proof to put icing on this study. Those apostles who were eyewitnesses of Jesus, his teachings, miracles and crucifixion and resurrection died horrible deaths because they would not recant what they claimed they saw and heard. All died except John who was exiled to the island of Patmos. When you are persecuted to your death for what you believe to be true through the sights and words you have heard and seen, you can trust these people to speak the truth. Its mere endurance speaks for itself. For thousands of years, people, which includes skeptics and atheists, have explored every nook and cranny of the Bible. Alleged difficulties have been systematically answered. Upon examination, there are no errors or contradictions in the Bible. The writers of the Bible, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote on hundreds of controversial subjects with absolute harmony from beginning to end. There is one unfolding story from Genesis to Revelation, the redemption of mankind through the Messiah. In Genesis you have paradise lost, and in Revelation you have paradise regained. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. You can't understand Revelation without understanding Genesis. It's all interwoven on hundreds of controversial subjects. Again, you will hear that this book, the Bible, was put together over a period of 1,600 years, 40-plus writers, different walks of life, different places, different times, different moods, different continents, 
three languages, yet this book is brought together in absolute harmony from beginning to the end. There is no other book in history to even compare to the uniqueness of its continuity. And that was written by Josh McDowell. Moreover, part of the testimony of the Bible's power and truth is the evidence of changed history and changed human lives. The Bible has answers for today's problems. The relevance of biblical truths become evident to those who study it. People become convicted and changed. The more one studies without bias the teachings found in the Bible, the more he or she will see that they conform to the truths of experience and human nature. It is just as powerful to the lives of people today as it was to those thousands of years ago. The Bible has proven to be trustworthy, powerful, and significant. There is not another book on earth that can prove itself to be the Word of God like the Bible, proving that God is who He claims to be. Thank you for listening. I have a few minutes left on this CD, so I am putting a few more prophecies on here. As you heard earlier, I said there are 2,000 prophecies. To be more specific, as I understand, 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament and 578 prophecies in the New Testament for a total of 1,817. These encompass 8,352 verses. Whether these have been fulfilled, are being fulfilled, or not yet fulfilled, I won't go into that for the sake of avoiding going off into all directions. What I will concentrate on are more of the prophecies Jesus fulfilled. A total of prophecies about Jesus, 300 were made. Not prophecies from Jesus, but to be more specific, prophecies about Jesus. I may have covered some of these already, but we'll try to avoid those and share ones that I haven't covered. My goal here is to add more compelling evidence that the Bible is the Word of God and can be trusted for everything that is written within. Take note when you hear of the dates that these prophecies were given. They were fulfilled in the New Testament, which given the times they were written around 50 to 150 A.D. No book authored by a mortal man could have written a book as amazing as the Bible. So hold on, here we go. Here are some prophecies about Jesus. He would be the Son of God, written in Psalm 2 verse 7 in 1000 B.C., fulfilled in Matthew 3:17. He would be a descendant of Abraham, written in Genesis 12 verse 3 and 22 verse 18, written in 1400 BC, fulfilled in Matthew 1:1. 1, 1. The Messiah would be a descendant of Isaac, Genesis 21:12, written in 1400 BC. He would also be a descendant of Jacob, written in Numbers 24 verse 17, both fulfilled in Matthew 1:2 and Luke 3 verse 34. He would be from the tribe of Judah, written in Genesis 49 verse 10, written in 1400 B.C., fulfilled in Matthew 1 verse 2 and in Luke 3 verse 33. He would be from the family of Jesse, uh, written in Isaiah 11 verse 1, about 740 to 680 B.C., fulfilled in Matthew 1 6 and Luke 3 verse 3. He would be raised up as a prophet like Moses, written in Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 and 18, written in 1400 B.C., fulfilled in Acts 3, verse 22, and Acts 7, verse 37. After he was born, babies would be killed in Bethlehem. Jeremiah 31, verse 15, written 627 to 580 B.C., fulfilled in Matthew 2 verses 16 and 18. He would be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us, written in Isaiah 7 verse 14, between 740 to 680 BC, fulfilled in Matthew 1 verse 23. He would be called out of Egypt, written in Hosea 11 verse 1, 720 BC. If you remember, Joseph and Mary fled to Egypt with Jesus, fulfilled in Matthew 2 verse 15. The Spirit of the Lord would be upon him, Isaiah 61, verse 1, written in 740 to 680 B.C., fulfilled in Luke 4, verses 16 through 21, and Matthew 12, 17 to 18. He would be preceded by a messenger, if we remember, John the Baptist, written in Malachi 3, verse 1, 430 B.C., fulfilled in Matthew 11, 10. 
He would do miracles written in Isaiah 35, verses 5 to 6, uh, written 740 to 680 B.C., fulfilled in Matthew 11, 2 to 5. Israel's king would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, written in the book of Zechariah 9, verse 9, uh, in 470 B.C., fulfilled in Matthew 21, verse 5 to 9, and John 12, verses 14 to 15. He would be hated for no reason. Psalm 35, 19, and 69, verse 4, written 1000 B.C., fulfilled in John 15, 25. He would be rejected by the religious rulers. Psalm 118, 22, written in 1000 B.C., fulfilled in Matthew 21, 42. He would be rejected by his own brothers. Psalm 69, verse 8, written in 1000 B.C., fulfilled in John 7, verse 5. He would be betrayed by friends, Psalms 41, 9, written in 1000 B.C., fulfilled in Matthew 10, verse 4, which was Judas Iscariot. His betrayer would eat bread with him. That was Judas Iscariot as well. Psalms 41, verse 9, written in 1000 B.C., fulfilled in John 13, verse 18 and 26, and Mark 14, verse 18. He would be betrayed for money, 30 pieces of silver, written in Zechariah 11, verse 12. That was 470 B.C., fulfilled in Matthew 26, 15. The betrayer's money would pay for a potter's field. That was written in Zechariah 11, 13. 470 B.C., fulfilled in Matthew 27, verse 7. He would be forsaken by the disciples, written in Zechariah 13, verse 7. That was 470 B.C., Fulfilled in Matthew 26, verses 31 and 56. He would be silent before his accusers. Written in the book of Isaiah 53, verse 7. That was 740 to 680 B.C. Fulfilled in Matthew 26, 62 to 63. There are about 20 prophecies in this list that deal with the details of him being crucified, nailed to the cross, and resurrected. All fulfilled. I'm not going to go through all those. The Messiah would be resurrected from the dead, written in Psalms 16.10 and Psalms 13, verse 3. That's 1000 B.C., fulfilled in Acts 2, verses 31, Acts 13, verse 33 to 35. He would ascend into heaven, written in Psalms 68, verse 18. That's 1000 B.C., fulfilled in Acts 1, verse 9, and Ephesians 4, verses 8 to 10. He would be seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, written in Psalms 110, verse 1, that's 1000 B.C., fulfilled in Acts 2, verse 34 to 35, and Colossians 3, verse 1. Jesus fulfilled more than 300 prophecies in the Bible in his coming to earth, his ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. Peter Stoner in Science Speaks from Chicago Moody Press back in 1963 calculated the probability of one man fulfilling 48 of those 300 prophecies to be one in 10 to the 157th power. That is the number 10 with 157 zeros attached to it. Not 300 prophecies, but only 48 prophecies about Jesus. What number could be found to explain the probability of one man fulfilling all 300 is beyond me even trying. I'm not even going to search for it. If anyone thinks that the Bible is not the Word of God, it is to their own demise. And maybe another time we can study on the prophecies about his re returning. You can count on it. The evidence is so compelling that it should convince you beyond a reasonable doubt. God left his fingerprints on these prophecies so you could figure out that he is real and the Bible is true. Permission for this work on the 300 prophecies about Jesus has been brought to us by Make Life Count Ministries in Prattville, Alabama. Thanks again for listening.